Hey everybody, this is Lauren Marie Taylor. You know me as Vicky from Friday the 13th Part 2, and as Stacy on the soap opera Loving, as Elaine with the candy underwear, as opposed to the brown underwear, but the candy underwear in Neighbors, and <laughs> Sheila, oh I want to feel ya, from Girls Night Out. And you are listening to the most amazing podcast called Don't Go Out There. So listen up, don't go out there, stay out of the woods. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Review Podcast. I uh, just want to take a second and thank all of our fans. You know, we're over 200 episodes now, and, you know, our, our, our fan support's just, just amazing. Um, and, you know, as always, we like to kind of take a break from some movie reviews and sit down with some of the legends of the business. And I'm excited about who we have joining us here today. Uh, we're actually joined by the leg- uh, well, another legend of the business. She's known best for her role as Vicky in Friday the 13th Part 2. Um, she's also host of Not the Final Girls podcast. Uh, please welcome the amazing Lauren Marie Taylor. Ms. Taylor, thank you so much for joining us here today. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's a delight to be here. You're way down where it's nice and warm, and I'm still up north where it's freezing. <laughs> uh, and But it's April, and it's 95 degrees out. So, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I kind of wish I could have some sort of, you know, in the middle there, but... Um, Anyway, I just, you know, we kind of like to kick off all of our interviews just by asking, you know, what is it that got you into acting? Um, Well, it's actually kind of an odd story. I was thinking about it today because I was reading an article in the New York Times about a voice teacher who I swear I crossed paths with early in my uh, career. But I was a very shy girl growing up, and my brother went to an all-boys school right next to my school, and he's only a year older than I am. And so he started getting involved with the productions, you know, the uh, a spring and the fall productions of his theater, the theater group at his school. And one of the girls had to drop out of a play. And he said, hey, why don't you come and audition? You know, they just need you to, I think it was like two words in the whole play, like help me or something like that. <laughs> right. And they just stuck me in and it kind of uh, got rid of my shyness. I overcame my, uh, I can't talk to anybody because I just don't talk to people, miss. And then, you know, it just spiraled um, into me figuring out that I could sing. So I started doing musicals. And one of the final musicals that I did was called Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I was in it it with Ali Sheedy from, you know, Ali Sheedy from Morgan. Yeah, Yeah, Breakfast Club. So she was my brother's girlfriend at the time um, when we were all in high school. Oh, yeah. Long history there. And her manager was at the show. And... Ali said to me afterwards, because she was the romantic lead and I was the comedian in the show. And so I had these big songs that I had to belt out. And I think that's how I came across that voice teacher that I was just reading about today. Anyway, um, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll meet her. And she said, oh, well, have you ever thought about doing TV commercials? And I'm like, well, no, I really was thinking about being a veterinarian. She goes, well, you can make some good money in the meantime. And I said, all right, I'll try it not thinking anything of it. I mean, no idea, you know, Right. it just wasn't in my brain to pursue it the way Allie already was. She was already doing commercials and whatnot. I was like, Oh, whatever. And a few months later, I booked a huge gig that wound up to me doing three years of, uh, of, uh, Burger King commercials and jingles. And that's how nice. it all started. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Um, just kind of getting into, and I won't hold you up too much cause I'm sure oh. you've, you know, hold up, you know, million, million times you've been asked 50 million Friday the 13th part two questions. Oh, no. Which way, so. no, it's OK. I don't, I don't mind. Actually, I was busy this morning. So this is actually a really good time. It's quiet. The dogs, we took them hiking. The dogs are all tuckered out. Yes, I do go into the woods. I'll admit that I do go. <laughs> but it's really to tuck around the dogs more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that for sure. Yeah. Um, so, gosh, you know, we've had over 70 something interviews probably by now. We've had as you know, people from all aspects of horror and just about every entry of the Friday franchise, except part two, for some reason. So, oh, wow. you're, so you're our first, um, you know, and, and from what honestly was, was such a groundbreaking movie. And I'm sure, like I said, you're tired to death of talking about it. So I won't ask you too many questions on it, but just to start off, can you talk me through the audition process that you had for, for Friday the 13th part two? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, the woman who was the casting director, Meg Simon, she had cast me in a whole bunch of TV commercials. So when the casting call came out for that, it was, um, I wasn't up for any of the other parts, but it was, uh, an all American nice girl next door. Nice. And immediately the call went into my agency 
And they said, hey, you know, um, they're doing, you know, a horror movie. It was called Jason at the time. And I went in and I auditioned. Very simple story. I auditioned. She knew me. She knew my work ethic. Very reliable person. And I, I booked it within days the job was mine. I didn't even have to go in and read for Steve Miner or anybody like that. Oh, so nice. that was kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, were you actually a fan of Friday the 13th part? Well, I guess just Friday the 13th. Like, no. Had you ever seen it at that point since, I mean, it was under a year between the release dates of part one and two. Yeah, I hadn't seen it. Um, you know, I wasn't, I was working so much, you know, that I never really, I, I really didn't go to movies a whole lot. And if I did, I was going to see things like Star Wars or, you know, Animal House, Fast Times, you know, things like that. Or if it was out yet, I don't know if Fast Times was out yet. But anyway, I wasn't really into, into it all. And like I said, like you said, they had just done it. Right. So there was no snowball effect, you know, with anything yet. Like there was after part three, I think then it was kind of like, Oh, what's this? What's, what's the, what are these Friday 13th movies? But no, I didn't know anything about it. In fact, um, a year later after filming it, I was in an off Broadway show with Kevin Bacon. We never, oh, never talked about Friday the 13th. And I mean, how bizarre is that? He's in part one. I'm right on his heels, but it never occurred to to either of us <laughs> that we were each in a Friday the, the 13th thing. So yeah, it was kind of weird. <laughs> well, okay. So we had Larry Zerner on from part three and he kind of said the most interesting part about filming part three was that it just kind of felt like it was going away to camp. You know, it just, he said, it, he said it was also filmed in chronological order. So I guess I'm just curious, you know, with minor doing parts two and three, like how similar the experience was on the shoot. Yeah. He pretty much did it in order of, how it was written. You know, when you see them during the day, we did all those during the day scenes first. And then, you know, as the kills are happening, it's in the order. So the, the later you are in kill season, you know, for Sackhead Jason, the more you sort of hung around, you know, and hung around, you know, the Pakanak Lodge, not doing anything. I mean, I hung out when other people were doing their scenes, like when Bill and Marta were doing their kill scenes. I just hung out with uh, Walt Gorney and a couple of other people in um, in the Pakanak Lodge because I didn't want to be up in my cabin up the hill by myself. So we all just hung out. But yeah, it was pretty much the same thing where he did it in chronological order. Yeah. Okay. Is there any like kind of behind the scenes things that you can really tell us about? You know, I mean, I believe I, I, I heard an interview one time with you saying that uh, you actually couldn't swim. Which oh, no. That's how you wound up on the beach scene. So that's uh, Yeah. With the ad lib, your face at Stu, at Stu Charno's character. Yeah, I couldn't swim. I couldn't drive a car. I mean, there were all kinds of things that Steve Miner was just like, what? What? I'm like, yeah, I grew up in the Bronx. We didn't need a car. So, then, you know, you never see her, you know, turning in any ignition or looking or driving anywhere. You don't see me swimming. I was filming a TV commercial when they were doing the running scene. So I had to leave and come back for that. So there were all kinds of weird things that were going on. But yeah, the swimming one was kind of, um, that was kind of a weird thing. Cause I think he just assumed, you know, I'd hop in the water, but then it worked out for the character because then she hangs out with Mark and doesn't go in the water. So, right. So was there any kind of behind the scenes uh, antics kind of going on? I believe Larry said they would play some practical jokes on each other in part three a lot. Was that kind of stuff happening behind the scenes here with uh, with you guys too? You know, it's funny. Um, Steve Miner, he, I guess maybe because it was the first one that he was doing, he ran a very tight ship. So there were no onset antics or joking around that went on that were not scripted. Um, but off camera, you know, we lived up the hill from the camp at another camp setting. Right. So the crew guys would be waiting in, in the woods and they would start crunching leaves as if they were chasing after you or <laughs> snapping branches. And then um, Bill and um, I think it was Russell, maybe Warrington, a few of the guys got together and they found out that I was a city girl and I was afraid of the dark. And they started scratching at the screen outside nice. my window of the cabin <laughs> causing me to black out you know oh, oh, wow. oh, i just crumpled yeah and i they were like learn 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 oh, so that wow. was kind of uh that was one of those things um but yeah yeah those were those were my experiences with that 
Okay, so you brought up the running scene, and speaking of running, you have kind of a history that ties back into Friday the 13th Part 2 a little bit with uh, with running. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, wait a second. What are you talking about? Let me think. You're a, well, you're a marathon runner. And you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, yeah, I was a marathon runner. Um, <laughs> I have a little thing that some, um, they, I'll move my thing over where they, yeah, you can see it's a little poster that they made up. Um, there was a big um, marathon runner back in the uh, 80s. His name was Rod Dixon. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I beat him in the marathon, but it's because he dropped out due to injury. So the big joke um, in the 80s when I was on the soap opera was, oh, Lauren Marie Taylor, she beat Rod Dixon, the top marathoner in the world. But anyway, yes, yeah, so during the day, you know, we'd be filming at night. And during the day, we were all kind of bored. And Kirsten Baker, who had that rocking body, I mean, she's still a gorgeous woman, obviously, if you've seen pictures of her from um, on the circuit and whatnot, you know, she's still beautiful. Here, still beautiful chick. Absolutely. Still rocking that uh, t-shirt too. Anyway, um, uh, so she, you know, I was like, oh my God, how do you have that body? I mean, it was just beautiful, you know, soft, but rock solid. She's a Lauren Marie, you really need to start running and exercising and, you know, all this business. So during the daytime when I should have been sleeping because we were filming at night, I started running. And in Kent, Connecticut, where um, where we were filming, it's very hilly. So when I came back to New York and started running in races, I was doing very well, like, you know, second of overall of women, fifth overall of all the women. And I was like, wow, this really works. And yeah, so it led to me running marathons. Yeah. yeah. And you were what? At, uh, at one point you were. Oh, yeah. 50, right? I mean, yeah, I was 77th in the world. Yeah. You were doing more than just running a little bit. That's not, I mean, you're trying to you're trying to play it down some, but you were great. Yeah, it's funny. My husband always said that if I had had the opportunity and the coaching, I probably would have, you know, been with the top, the top, top. And, you know, he always says, oh, you could have been an Olympian. Because, I mean, I, I was I was like Forrest Gump. I was like, I just kept running. <laughs> I just, and I wouldn't, wouldn't get tired. It's, that's a funny story, actually. Um, one year, um, our local PBS station, they had um, a lot of those children's programming things, you know, right. ele- electric company, stuff like that. And they got wind of me and decided to have a camera crew uh, track me throughout the marathon. Right. And I made a, I made a prediction. I was like, well, the last one's three hours. Another one was three seventeen. I said, you know what? I'll pro- I'm slowing down a little bit. So, cause I didn't have enough time to train when I was on the soap opera. So I said, I said, you know, I think it'll probably take me three hours and 45 minutes, you know, because I was slowing down that that's slow. Right. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, they had me wired up. So I was running with a microphone pack, you know, at my hip, you know, with it attached and everything like that. So I'm running, you know, and I'm t- and my husband was with the crew and I, he said, hun, where are you? Where are you? And I would tell him where I was. And he goes, oh my God, she's like a half an hour ahead of herself. I didn't realize I was running that fast because back then they didn't have all those mile markers that tell you what right. your pace is. You were just kind of like running. Well, you know, I'm, oh, there she is. Oh, she's famous. Oh, there she is. Oh, that's kind of cool. You know, the famous runners, I mean. And um, they wound up having to scramble to get to the finish line, to catch me coming through the finish line. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, and then another time my husband decided to run the marathon and I was running it too. And we had on matching t-shirts that had the name of the soap opera on them called Loving. And he was running through um, upper Manhattan and and some guy said, hey, yo, I saw somebody with the same T-shirt on, some chick with the same T-shirt on. And he goes, wow, that's my wife. How long ago did you see her? He goes, about an hour ago, man. <laughs> <laughs> my husband said that he just stopped and started walking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, that's a good segue. Speaking of your husband, uh, 81, 82 was kind of a, was, was pretty big for you. I mean, not only Friday the 13th Part 2, but you had neighbors as the famous elaine yeah. and and girls night out can you talk a little bit about working on those films as well and like i said you know you you had a i would say a pretty semi-serious relationship come out of working on the set of girls night out uh, <laughs> happy yeah. anniversary by the way happy anniversary. thank you thank you 39 years april 23rd which is also shakespeare's birthday and shakespeare's death day funny enough um wow. but yeah we met on the set of the movie and he i mean he's 
he's around somewhere. I don't know where he is. He's puttering in the garden. He, sometimes he'll jump in, you know, actually sometimes he'll just come in and go, hon, what are you doing? I'll go, come here, come and talk. Um, but anyway, um, we were, he tells this story about how when we would go on commercial calls, he'd say that, you know, it goes, and she would always walk into the room and I would just like stare at her, but I couldn't say anything to her because she's just talking to everybody and this outgoing personality, you know, and then he said that, and then we're finally at the movie and there she is. So he made a beeline towards me. He, he knew, he knew what he wanted. And yeah, we uh, started dating while we were filming Girls Night Out, which was kind of cool. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, then there's Neighbors <laughs> with my man, Belushi. Yes, with your man, Belushi. <laughs> yeah, that was that was kind of a fun story because, um, um, okay, so I was doing that off-Broadway show, right, with right. Kevin Bacon was in it, right? So I was understudying, you know, it was a four-person show. So you understudy, you know, everybody's lines. And... <laughs> Jennifer Gray, who just came out with uh, with a book, she was doing the same part in Chicago. Oh, well, she had her 21st birthday and she fell down and bumped her crown and couldn't go on stage for a week. So they flew me out to Chicago, hop off the plane, and I go right into the role without even meeting the actors. And I think it was Alan Ruck and Alec Baldwin. Not Alec Baldwin, Adam Baldwin. Yeah, wow. Alec I met years later. But anyway... um. So I did that and I came back and, you know, you had those old answering machines, right? And there's, you know, the agents, Lauren, Lauren, as I call up, I go, what, what's going on? And they go, they can't find somebody to play John Belushi's daughter for a new movie that they're doing. Get over to the audition right now. They're waiting for you. I said, I just got off the plane. You know, they said, go. So I ran, I was five block, blocks away from where John Alvidson, the director lived. So I'm running, I'm running, I get in, I go, I'm mean, literally, I'm panting like a dog when I get in there. <laughs> You know, and Belushi's there with the one eyebrow up, you know, that type of thing. And I go, hi. And they go, well, where were you? And I said, well, I was in Chicago. Well, then we started talking about Chicago. I didn't even have to read. So I go back to my appointment. I'm like, this is kind of weird. I didn't read. And the phone rings. Go back. They want you to read. I'm like, so I ran back. Right? Ran back. Now, mind you, I hadn't watched Saturday Night Live. Right. So I didn't really, I wasn't like, oh my God, Belushi and Aykroyd, oh my God, Blues Brothers. I wasn't like that. Right. And they appreciated it. So I read with them and then we just started shooting the breeze. Like, yeah, what else have you done? I was like, yeah, I did a horror movie and, you know, this and that. And they're like, yeah, yeah. So I go, I go back to my apartment, phone, they like you, you got the part. You have to go back and sign contracts. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 15 blocks. Like, yeah. Wow. Well, that was nothing. But then, you know, because, he, oh, Danny Aykroyd was talking about getting in shape because, um, you know, what, they asked you a lot of stuff, you know, and I told him that I was a runner and he's like, oh, I'm going to start running. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Awesome. That's an awesome story. I, I honestly didn't put you I, together with the, with uh, Belushi and, and all that. And I just, I guess I didn't really realize that you had read with them. And that's really cool. That's really cool. Oh, funny. it was a great time. Whenever, you know, people always say, you know, you know, what was your favorite thing, you know, that you did? And I think the horror community gets upset when I don't say it's Friday 13th, <laughs> you know, or Girls Night Out. And my husband gets upset because that's where I met him. But I always say doing Neighbors was the most fun I'd ever had in my entire life. The most fun. Yeah. That's, that is awesome. So, and you kind of brought it up earlier just for, uh, for a little bit, but that you were on that long running series loving. Um, <laughs> okay. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, and, and also like, did you enjoy doing movies more or the TV series? More? It's so different. It's right. very different. I mean, TV is, different now also because I've been on TV sets in the past few years. So it's it's very different. It, it's shot more like a movie now okay. too, you know, where the scenes are broken up, you know, whereas on the soap opera, you have multiple cameras on you, which they do for TV series, but you do the entirety of your scene without stopping. Right. And the whole mantra on our set was, even if you make a mistake, keep going, just keep going. They can edit it in the editing room because of the three different cameras, well, you know? Exactly. So it was harder work. There's, you know, cause you have so much to memorize 
you know, because we didn't have teleprompters. They got rid of the teleprompters on our cameras very early on, whereas a lot of the other soap operas still had the teleprompters. So you could sort of like look at this to the side like this and look for your lines. And they didn't, uh, we didn't have that. So we had to memorize tons of lines. But, you know, by year, I don't know, eight or nine, I could go off book a little bit. And I don't want to say ad lib because you don't want to diss the writers, but because you know your characters so well from doing it for so long, you can improvise a little bit you know, so that you can keep going if you screw up or forget a line. Okay. Um, so tell, tell me a little bit about your podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying, I'm working on it, you know, it's called the Not the Final Girl podcast. And um, um, I've interviewed, obviously, people in from my own movie. Um, I have a young, a uh, couple of young directors uh, who have been on. I just interviewed um, Diane Franklin, who I just adore. And of course, Felissa, Felissa Rose and whatnot. But you know, I've had starts and stops with it. It's about a half hour format. So if we have a long chat, then I'll break it up into two different episodes because the format is half an hour. I want to kind of stick to that. Um, except if it's a mini podcast, like with Darcy DeMoss, she, right. she had something to do, you know, that day. I mean, she was all made up and ready to go and I knew it. And it was hard scheduling. So that was a mini pod. So that was only um, 18 minutes long. But it's really, you know, we chat about everything. We chat about a lot of us have very similar early careers. So we talk about that. We talk about our experiences. Same thing with directors, other actors. We, You know, the director talk, talks about how um, James Sweet was the most recent one. He talks about the concept and how he forms the concept and, you know, writing and everything. So it's really kind of cool to listen to the creative processes of other people. But it's, like I said, it's been start and stop, start and stop because, you know, um, uh, our house is uh, going on the market because we're downsizing. I'm doing so, the same thing. I'm doing the same thing. Oh my gosh, so much work. You know, you're in a house for 30 years. Oh yeah, I had I had um, somebody in the can, who I, I have recently, I think it was Russell Todd. I had him in the can for a month. And I, oh, wow. and I, I didn't have time to edit right. because I was so busy here and I felt so bad about that, but I'm hoping to start to get into a more regular routine, but I have a feeling it probably won't be until after everything is settled here. And then I'll be able to do what you do, which is put it out more consistently. But I, I appreciate people who listen to it. I've gotten, you know, nice notes from people on Instagram who love it. And, you know, it's nice to hear the feedback from the people. Yeah. Well, all of our fans, make sure you go and follow the Not Another Final Girl podcast. <laughs> it's not the final girl. But you know what they um, I don't have an Instagram for that. I only have just my Lauren Marie Taylor with the number one behind my name. Okay. And that's where I'll post stuff. Um, I'm trying to do a website, but I'm just horrible at it. So I think I'm going to have to start that all over. You know, you know, if you're not if your brain doesn't work in that way, right. I, I just can't figure out how to put stuff on my website. So it's kind of in a holding pattern. So I'm not promoting my website because it is a hot mess. So I may just have to ditch the Not the Final Girl website and just start all over with a more Lauren Marie Taylor one and just throw all the podcast stuff in there. Okay. <laughs> well, if you need any help, let me know. You've got my contact number. I can help you out. Do you know how to put together a website? Yes, I, I, I'm the producer. I did all of our stuff here, so I, I don't. No way! Mm, please help. <laughs> I would love. I would love to help you out. I, I appreciate you coming on, so I'd love to help you out. No oh no, they, no, it's great. I, I I enjoyed. I'm glad we were able to do this because I know we, with the holidays and everything too, we kind of had a, a little bit of a back and forth. So it's nice wow. to actually get it done. So when you, it's funny because when you uh, rem, he sent me a little reminder on Instagram, and I was like. Dude, I got my alarm set, <laughs> but I can tell you that. So I was like, I hope it doesn't think I'm like ditzy, which, yeah, but. <laughs> no, it's just like you said, life happens. It's hard to schedule every, I mean, you know, it's hard to schedule. That's the hardest part about the whole job is, is just scheduling. Um, I, one last question is just a fun little question that, you know, we actually started uh, started uh, asking with Lisa Wilcox when she came on. And it's just the the answers that we've gotten have been so insane, especially from like Kane and, and everybody else. <laughs> it's, oh, I, I, so we've started asking with everybody. It's, it's like I said, it's just a fun little question. So don't get scared about it. But um, you, you, 
you uh, frequent the convention circuit. Um, mm-hmm. And 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 by the way, like sidebar, horror fans are the best, right? Like all oh, these years, all these years later, I mean, you're still doing interviews about this little old movie from from 1981. So yeah. Um, but what is the strangest, or heck, even just some, anything that just stands out to you that you've seen at a convention? <laughs> That's funny because I asked, or had happened to you one of the either ones. Yeah, I ask a very similar question. Actually, it's kind of funny. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, for autographing something. Obviously, the brown undies. Okay. <laughs> when they come up with the brown undies, I just go, oh, my God, help me. You know? <laughs> I mean, I do a photo op with them, funny enough. I do oh, a whole wow. photo op in the undies these days. And I started that as a dare. But the brown undies are possibly uh, beyond yickiness that I have to relive that moment every time. So that's kind of that's kind of funny. Um, and then, but the most fun was, um, meeting Richard Dreyfus. Oh yes. That was, and I'm not a fangirl cause I usually ask people, you know, when you go to conventions, have you ever fangirl or fanboyed anybody? And you'd be surprised at the funny, the answers to that, that, but that, that, that's a good question too, that people like to answer. Um, but I, I totally fangirled on Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> I mean, I was shaking inside, but I was just like, I mean, oh, my table is right across from yours, you know, so he didn't think I was like the crazy person that I yeah. am, you know, so I had him do like a birthday shout out to a friend of mine, um, another podcaster, Robbie Vegas, and he did a shout out. Maybe it wasn't a birthday. It was just a shout out. Um, oh, no, that was somebody else. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. That was Alice Cooper who did that. Okay. So I fangirled Richard Dreyfus, and I'm sure you're going to clean this up when you edit. <laughs> But I fangirled Richard Dreyfus, and I told him that my favorite movie of his was Mr. Holland's Opus, because uh, I really liked him in that. But then the other fangirl was Alice Cooper. Alice and Cooper. Yeah. I got to meet him without having to go through, you know, you have to go through a couple of people where they make you pay, and then you uh, uh, get the pictures selected, and you have right. X amount of time to say hi to him. Right. I just said, um, can you let him know that, you know, you know I know... Um, um, ah, Tommy McLaughlin, who directed part six. And of course he used his music in part six. Love that song too, by the way. Oh, I love it. I mean, he gets up, Alice Cooper gets up and he goes, come on over here, let her through, come on. So I go over there and, you know, we did a little video together and he was the one who did a shout out oh, to God. Robbie Vegas of the All Bets Are Off podcast. So that was really cool. That was very cool. And my husband's like, why didn't you tell him that I'm a big fan? Because I said, I, I didn't know. And you should have texted me when I said he was here. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, but it's, so it, it's before, fun. Though. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it, it's fun. I, I really enjoy meeting everybody. You know, I've been fortunate enough to travel to Germany and England last year. And it, I mean, our cosplayers here are tremendous. Yeah. And the cosplayers in Europe are, they, really they go all out also it's such a great thing to to be a part of all that and you know i i would use the term hook up but i know that means something different now right, right. but when i was younger hooking up with just meant meeting people <laughs> so i don't hook up with cosplayers <laughs> but it's fun to meet so many people who love the franchise and and all over the world and especially here at home it's just great i i, I really feel very blessed with with the community well, before we get out of here, I mean, is, is there anything coming up for Lorraine, Lauren Marie Taylor that, uh, you know, anything you'd like to plug before, before before we get out of here? Um, Well, I usually post stuff at my Instagram page, my Lauren Marie Taylor one. But I have a Friday the 13th mini con coming up. I'm not sure when this is going to air, but it's actually May, Friday the 13th. Nice. Yes, yeah, so I'll be there Friday the 13th and the 14th. And that's at the Blairstown Diner in Blairstown, New Jersey which is where they filmed some of the scenes in part one. So they're doing, it's only Friday the 13th people. So it's, that's why it's called a mini con. And they're going to be people there uh, from all the different parts, which is really cool. Yes. Yeah, so that that's doing, and then I'm, uh, I haven't signed the contracts yet, but I have a little gig coming up um, that'll be filmed at some point. Um, I, but I haven't signed anything yet. So until usually I don't, mention anything until it's set in stone and understand yeah i mean i haven't even started memorizing the lines yet because until the contract is there i like zip it up (laughs) 
relationship. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed sitting here with you for the past half hour and, and oh, discussing everything. Thank you. You're, you're an amazing person. No, listen, thank you for having me. It's a great way to spend a beautiful Sunday afternoon. I'm just happy that you asked me. It's really cool. And I love the name of your podcast. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, I, our uh, co-host uh, came up with that and he'll love to hear that too. So, um,